I would like to thank like to thank you for attending and we're looking forward to the program. Let me introduce myself. I'm the project uh, sorry, the projects coordinator at Delaware River Greenway Partnership. The DGRP works to bring individuals, communities, businesses, recreational uses and all governments together to promote and protect a continuous quarter of natural and cultural resources along our beloved Delaware River. The DGRP played a leading role in the successful campaign to bring the Lower Delaware River in the National Wild and Scenic River System. I would like to introduce you to Dr. Alan Hunt. He serves as the Musconetcon Watershed Association's Director of Policy and Grants. His role includes acting as the River Administrator for the Musconet Wild and Scenic River and managing restoration and adapted reuse for the historic Asbury Mill. Currently, the MWA is developing its first Musconetcon Scenic and Recreational River National Park Service brochure, a watershed-wide interpretive plan, and is beginning to plan and exhibit design phase for the Asbury Mills Interpretive Center. As a native to the watershed and growing up on a third generation family farm, Dr. Allen's perspective on people's interaction with the land and water quality greatly informed his work, laying a foundation for how and why ecological restoration benefits water quality, wildlife habitat, and recreation. I'd like to thank you all for joining and for Dr. Hunt for presenting. Are you ready to take it from there? You bet. Thank you for the introduction, Cindy. Well, good evening, folks. I'm glad to be here. Um, Alan Hunt, I'm the Director of Policy and Grants at the Musconetcon Watershed Association. And we're going to go on a journey tonight in time and in space and look at the geography of the Musconetcon Watershed in its relationship to the Delaware River. And a lot of that has to hinge around mountains. And what we're looking at here is the Musconetcon Gorge at sunset a couple months ago. And uh, this gorge and how passable it is has a lot to do with the differences of how the Musconetcon River was settled compared to the Delaware River. We're gonna explore that and some other features as well. But first I'd like to introduce the Musconetcon Watershed Association. Our mission is uh, to protect and improve the quality of the Musconetcon River watershed including natural and cultural resources. And we do this through different programs. We have a water quality program, we do education and outreach, we're involved in river restoration, and we also do work in policy. And what this translates to is activities, if my slides advance, there we go, that uh, really try to cover the whole gamut of what goes on in the watershed. So we are in schools, we do a summer camp, uh, we do talks like this. We have our annual river cleanup in April, which is coming up next month. We have volunteers that go out and monitor the river water quality. And we also conduct our own water quality monitoring, often with university partners. And we do ecological restoration projects like dam removals and stream restorations and forming partnerships with farmers to improve a farm conservation. So like the Lower Delaware Wild and Scenic River, the Musconetcon is also a National Wild and Scenic River. You can see here where uh, the Musconetcon comes into the Delaware River, we're New Jersey's largest tributary to the Delaware. And we have three segments that are wild and scenic. One in the upper part of our watershed up by Hackettstown and uh, south of Lake Musconetcon. Uh, this part that's in the middle of the Musconetcon. This will be where we probably spend more attention uh, this evening in this lower segment that hasn't yet been designated, but we're hopeful it will be soon, that connects directly to uh, Delaware River. So the idea here with this talk is going to explore a lot of the resources that made us a National Wild Scenic River. Be looking at uh, cultural resources, historic, archaeological resources. And for the presentation tonight, these are the questions that I started with. And they're the same questions I had as a kid growing up here. 
why does the landscape look the way it does? When did different people inhabit the Musconecon Valley? Why are the roads where they are? Why does the Musconecon Valley look different from other parts of New Jersey or Pennsylvania or the world? And I quickly developed a fascination for maps and photographs. And you're gonna see that throughout the presentation tonight. We're gonna to be able to answer each of these questions and as a quiz later. So try to remember that we're gonna come back to these questions near the end, but not right at the end of the presentation. So one of the organizing ideas I, I used for this for tonight was that I had a history teacher in high school. His name was Mr. McGinnis and he taught world history. But he had this, this, this saying that geography is where history happens. And that's gonna be our common theme through everything that we're gonna look at tonight. Because we're gonna try and answer this one question. How does the landscape influence where people live? So to understand this, we're gonna to have to go back in time. We're gonna go back to before there were glaciers. And that's gonna help answer this question around the landscape and how it came to be. So this little mini lesson in geography is gonna help us answer this question about how the landscape influenced where people lived. This is a slightly stylized photograph of the upper watershed where there's uh, more mountains, and where glaciers left behind deposits that have been quarried out over time. So we're gonna go back in time to about 10 million years ago. And it's hard to believe, but where the rivers flowed was much different millions of years ago. These ancient river paths carved out gaps in the hard granite ridges of the highlands. You don't see a Delaware River here. In fact, you see many rivers heading south. And these gaps that formed through these ancient river paths would then become places that people used to pass through the mountains as natural openings. And they'd be used again and again as technology for transportation changed. About eight to two million years ago, those rivers going through those ancient gaps then started to carve out the much softer valley bottom material and the course of the rivers changed. And this is when we see the river network that we see today evolve with the Delaware River and these tributaries like the Musconecon, the Peak West, and the Pollen Skill. So about 10 million years ago, where you see the top of the ridge in this photograph, that was pretty much where the top of the ridge was 10 million years ago. That hard granite's really hard. And the valley bottom was only maybe 100 feet lower than that top, about where I drew this red line here. And you can see where the valley bottom is now. That's about 600 feet lower than the top of the ridge. So that's how much carving out happened from about 10 million years ago to about 2 million years ago, which is when we first started getting some significant ice ages. The Earth had turned into a cold phase and Arctic conditions expanded, and deep glaciers covered all of Alaska, Canada, and much of the northern United States. Northern New Jersey was transformed into a barren, cold, frozen landscape. Rivers were frozen and completely covered over in ice. So over a period of about a million and a half years, that purple edge there you see in the glacier, that was part of the Illinois ice sheet, it moved back and forth about 10 times. And that was like a giant scrub brush carving out the river valleys from a V notch, just from erosion to a U shape. And what happened after that was that when the glaciers receded, they left behind all this broken rock that they had carved out. And as the rivers flowed down, started to fill up those U shaped valleys. And we got that flat valley bottom shape that you saw in the earlier photograph. And it created these terraces along the floodplain. The floodplain would frequently get flooded, but above that there would be these shelves of debris that would be safe out of the floodwaters. 
those terraces would be providing close proximity for people in the future to provide uh, access to water and fish, but it's outside that flood zone. Now, the last ice age that we had, those glaciers weren't done yet, was about 21,000 years ago. And the Arctic conditions returned, but they were just a little bit further north of that prior Illinois ice age. So if you want to put that in context, the edge of the polar ice cap was right in the middle of New Jersey. And this is about the extent of that Wisconsin ice age. It hung on to about 17,000 to 15,000 years ago, and actually much longer in New York and Northern England, not too far to the north. So you can see the distinction here between the last of the Illinois ice ages and then the Wisconsin one. And uh, you can see this difference still in the landscape today. Basically above this line, we have narrow valleys of lakes and bogs. And downstream, you have those wider valleys from that earlier ice age. But to be honest, like this map, I, I think it's a little dry. So let's take a look at another map to explain this. Here you go, you can see the water in this one. And uh, the upper watershed was carved a lot by those glaciers and how they started to melt. Uh, the upper tributaries like Lover's Run were carved out at this time, Lake Apacon is a glacial lake, and the flows from the glaciers as they drained carved the river path up there. And you can see these narrow river valleys up here where the last glacier was. The natural gaps left from these glacial periods was when what would then be used later on for things like the Morris Canal or railroads to go through. But you know, this map, it makes me feel a little flat. So let me show you something else. Let's go a little 3D here. All that glacial melt water carried that debris of broken bedrock, cobble, sand, fine clay, and left these hills behind called moraines. And they formed part of those plateaus along the floodplain. And also some of this material got washed down into the river as well, forming those terraces further down where the last glacier, uh, south of that last glacier. Now, if you were to drive along Willow Avenue, north of Hackettstown, you'd actually be driving on Moraine until you reach State, Stephen State Park. That's a residential community along there now. But, you know, this is still making me feel it's like this is just a little too black and white for my taste. So let's look at this from another perspective. <clears throat> so here you go. The landscape transition from a 2000 foot glacier, it looked pretty much like the Arctic or the Antarctic. And the glacier started to retreat about 17,000 years ago. And then the, that purple line that we saw before right around Hackettstown would have been like this, a pretty harsh, windy, cold, icy, gravelly landscape. And when the glacier was done, it would have left behind a barren landscape like this that wasn't hospitable at all. It would have had virtually no plant life in it. But then things began to change as things warmed up. So the valley would have been cold and it would have been harsh. If you walked in it, you'd hear small stones crunching beneath your feet. The river channel hadn't yet settled in place yet. It was a series of braided channels pushing stones further downstream from the moraine, which is up here. Only plants that could colonize the mineral soils and rocks could survive, like lichens and mosses. And it wasn't even tundra, it was more like the top of our region's highest peaks, like Mount Washington in New Hampshire. Now, if you were standing on Schoolies Mountain, a little bit later on, looking across the valley, you might have seen the confluence of Lake Apacon's uh, meltwaters and Lubbers Run, forming a sinuous type of delta like this, with glacial moraines downstream, like above. This might have been the area around uh, Alamuchi Mountain State Park, Stevens State Park, Hackettstown. And it might have been in this Arctic tundra like of landscape with some grasses coming in, maybe low shrubs or stunted trees trying to colonize parts of the landscape. And an alpine forest would have taken hold. And quite literally, the roots of the plants and trees slowed down the erosion as they carpeted the slopes and the riverbanks. 
They broke the wind and they provided the food too for animals to come in. And that's about when this landscape would have been first colonized uh, by the megafauna that we had of the Ice Age. And the humans probably began to follow in those animals and started to explore this frosty fringe of barely hospitable land. So maybe an image like this might have been what the Muskinacon Valley looked like when humans first arrived around 13,000 uh, years ago. And eventually, the landscape became a dense spruce fir forest. It wasn't quite that foreboding landscape of ice and wind and stone anymore. And it might have looked something like this subalpine forest or a coastal forest that you would see in Labrador, Canada today. It was cool and it was damp. And it wasn't a particularly productive environment. But sometime in this transition from alpine forest and spruce fir forest, not less than a thousand years after the glacier retreated, humans formed their first settlements on the river terraces formed by those glacial outwashes about 13,000 years ago. So to sum it up, the landscape as we see it was formed by the rivers that changed the course from going basically down south, which formed the gaps, and then began flowing down to the southwest about eight to two million years of process for that to happen. The valleys were carved by glaciers over a long period, about a million and a half to 20,000 years ago. The valleys filled in, those terraces and moraines wound up being good places for people to settle once the vegetation had changed and once the animals had started to come in. And that's when we got people. So uh, the presence of uh, Native Americans is relatively well documented in the Musconecon Valley. There aren't too many of these very old Paleo Indian sites in the east, but uh, we have one of them, the plunge site, as you see here on the sign. So for about uh, 10,000 years, things were pretty much the same. You know, the fish had recolonized the rivers from the seas, the nut bearing hardwoods had taken over and were used for food and shelter. No longer were there large megafauna like giant beavers. The mammals we have today were pretty much the mammals that people had back then and were a good food source. And over time, uh, Native Americans became uh, uh, more expansive and more settlements and villages uh, expanded throughout the valley. There was trade all along the eastern seaboard and items from the coastal plain were traded inland through routes using the rivers and the gaps to the mountains. And eventually the people known as the Lenape found their home here. So just to give you a sense of this, uh, this is a map showing uh, known uh, Native American sites. So the uh, circles here and uh, the larger rectangles. There's about uh, 50 shown on this map. Here's the Delaware, here's like a pack on, and this is about where the glacier is uh, or was in the past. And you can actually see where the moraines are and you can see the villages pretty close uh, to where those are. And here's the plunge site. Uh, that's the oldest documented site uh, in the Musconecon. Uh, we're also going to talk about this village here, Peloisi, uh, a little bit later on. But so just kind of remember that uh, that's one of the Native American villages. So in the 1600s, uh, you know, this part of North America is being colonized by Europeans from two different directions. From the west out of the New York Harbor, or from the south up the Delaware. And what happened early on in Northwestern New Jersey had much more to do with Philadelphia than New York. The agreement that William Penn made with the Lenape, uh, the Treaty of Shaka Maxon, or also called the Penn Treaty, was made in what's now the Fishtown neighborhood of Philadelphia in 1682. And it paved the way for the colonization in the Delaware River Valley. Following its signing, explorers and traders naturally progressed up the Delaware River Valley. And this is one of the wampum belts uh, signifying uh, that treaty in the uh, agreement between uh, William Penn and the Lenape. Coloni colonization proceeded along where it was easiest. At first, this was the coastal and riverine areas accessible by boat. On the Delaware River, the region up to Trenton Falls 
was occupied by European colonists by about 1685. So if we're looking at this map, uh, Trenton's right about here in, in this cross hatching. Philadelphia's down here. So you can see that this area was easily settled. But when we get further north of the falls, the area where the Musconecon is, wasn't settled until about 1735. And you can also see the areas around New York Harbor were settled pretty easily. And the main barrier between uh, the east and the west part of New Jersey were the Wachung Mountains and then also the Musconecon Mountain. When the explorers and traders went up the river from Philadelphia, that exploration only went so far inland. They didn't really go up smaller river reaches like the Musconecon River. And they don't seem to have proceeded past the narrow Musconecon Gorge, which I've drawn here on the map. It's narrow and it's a steep sided area, has cascading books going down the side of it. South of the gorge, the Musconecon Valley is relatively narrow, about a mile or a little more with not a lot of flat land. So maybe this didn't look like the most obvious place to settle. You had a mountain and gap at the top and maybe not the most expansive land area that you would want. And for the Europeans, most of Northwestern New Jersey was beyond the frontier in, in the very early 1700s. It was literally uncharted territory, as you can see in this map of 1706. I think this is where that mouth of the Musconecon was recorded. But as you can see, we're not getting too far up that river. But there's much more developed knowledge about the Raritan River just over the Musconecon Mountain. People had followed it uh, from New York. There's much more developed knowledge uh, south of the Musconecon, uh, even north of where Trent is today. So for the Lenape, they were still here when the colonists were coming. Northwestern New Jersey was a refuge. It was a place for a people who were being displaced from settlers coming from the east and the south. It was a place to hunker down behind the Wachung Mountains that looked toward New York and the rugged escarpments along the Delaware River. Also food was a factor. It was less game as the settlers began to hunt it out but there were still fish and the soil was fertile. The Lenape took on a more settled and agrarian lifestyle to produce the food they needed to survive. When the first known European surveyors made their way west to map and claim land, they found villages that they called Indian plantations. The surveyors would note these villages as signs of fertile soils. And they also noted sites good to build dams. Both of those features would enhance the value of the land as it was sold. But the rich Lenape culture and its people were taking the toll of foreign diseases as well. So when surveyor John Redding in 1915, sorry, 1715, proceeded down from Lake Apacon to nowadays Hampton, he noted one village near Halsey's Island, a wig and a wigwam that was apparently abandoned and Peloisi, a village near Hampton. Of Peloisi, he sought to survey more of the land, but was turned away. And he did not continue further downriver toward the Delaware, and instead turned back east and proceeded to Peapack via the gap at Glen Gardner. So you can see when the colonists came to explore the Musconecon, it happened from a couple different directions. It came through the Delaware River, around the 1700s, over land using the gap at Glen Gardner through the Musconecon Mountain like John Redding did. And then there were other paths that would eventually become uh, the New Brunswick Eastern Turnpike around 1740. That's this one here. And then the Trenton Eastern Turnpike around 1750. Both of these used a small passes in the mountains, but not a big gap like here in Glen Gardner. The paths the colonists use often follow the same routes used by the Lenape because those were the routes that favored crossing the mountains. But let me dissuade you from thinking that those routes that we call turnpikes 
were a major advancement in transportation technology. The roads at this time were really very poor. The paths that John Redding followed, those so-called Indian trails, he called them blind paths. They were very narrow. And for him riding up upon a horse, he was often having his clothes torn and pulled out by the branches. And he could not follow the paths most of the time without having a Lenape guide. And that turnpike, the main improvement of it was that it was a wide path. The surface wasn't improved. Horses could go on it and probably a wagon. But it was earthen and dusty and dry and muddy when it was wet. The name Turnpike came from the gate across the road's entrance where a fee was collected. Now this image is from North Carolina, it's a much later era, but I think it gives you an idea about the challenges of overland transportation in the 1700s. It's a far cry from today's modern turnpikes. And so the cultural settlement patterns of Northwest New Jersey largely reflect just how far specific groups of people made it inland with the types of transportation available to them in that day and age. From the south of the Musconetcon, the influences were primarily English, as mostly Quakers moved north along the Delaware River. So you'll see that here marked with the P's. East of the Musconetcon, it was more heterogeneous. It was a mixture of I English, Scots, Irish, and Germans. And that's marked here. These the Z's are this heterogeneous zone. Europeans moved inland to farm and cut timber to mine iron, and forges were built along fast moving rivers like the Musconetcon in this time period. Uh, the major roads that you're seeing here, these are um, kind of rough approximations of where they were located. I think this was the, the Trenton Easton Turnpike, for example, but it doesn't show it going out to Easton. Um, but that gives you an idea of the modern lay of the land, and that's County Road 579, by the way. Now, the closest remaining examples we have of a settler homestead from this era is in Siegeltown. It's a homesteading village that was founded in 1793, so a bit later on, time period-wise, but I wanted to introduce this to give you a sense of uh, what houses might have looked like in the early 1700s and mid-1700s. And it, it, things would have been made out of logs, just like this. And this is one of two surviving log cabin homes in New Jersey. And probably because they were made of wood is why we don't have much record of those earlier settler homesteads. A homestead at the time would have mu looked much like this. So we, as I mentioned, we don't have those log structures but the cultural connections to Philadelphia are still evidenced in this building style. The style of this two-story masonry house with two upper windows on the ends up here, it's called an eye type. And then it's called this eye type or eye house because the interior floor plan has a central hallway with a stairway and rooms on both floors connected to that hallway. So if you think about this, the rooms are kind of the hat and the foot of the eye that's turned sideways. And then the central part of the eye, the stem, is the hallway and a crossing in between. Uh, you'll see these all throughout the Musconetcon Valley and this area in New Jersey. And the, the style was even copied later, but the earliest ones are what anchor this region uh, in its uh, Philadelphia related heritage. So even by 1756, with those turnpikes that were created, there was still only a little bit to draw on a map. So you can see here, there's not even a road going across the Musconetcon. Small iron forges developed using locally mined ore, charcoal from the forest to melt the ore, and water power to turn great bellows, like here, it changed water on the Musconetcon. Forges of the era were Chelsea's Forge near Siegeltown, or present day Finesville, change water, and Squires Forge close to Penwell. But New Jersey was still a frontier state. The Lenape might have sold or ceded their land as their numbers diminished, but up until 1756, the French and Indian War, 
or the Seven Years' War between England and France, they were coexisting in some fashion alongside the colonists. Border forts wound up being constructed between northern New Jersey and Pennsylvania. This is from Belvedere up to Port Jura, so a little bit north of where we are, but important to indicate that it was a frontier and not very well settled, even by this time. For the British, the Lenape land rights were extinguished in New Jersey with the 1758 Treaty of Easton. The British sought to establish peace with several tribes and proposed to limit the westward colonial expansion west of the Allegheny Mountains in return for peace. The Lenape still retained fishing and hunting rights in New Jersey, but this began a long history of displacement and westward movement for the Lenape to Oklahoma, to Wisconsin, and north to Canada. But some Lenape remained and are still here today. So over this time period, about the 1750s or so, the natural landscape, the climate, the topography, the plants, the animals, the fish, those were the dominant factors affecting where people lived and how they lived. And accordingly, we've gone through those factors up to this point, about the 1750s, looking at this with a broad landscape of northern New Jersey and then looking at the Musconetcon watershed. But in the latter half of the 18th century, other factors began to dominate where and how people lived. The Musconetcon was now a landscape repeopled with European colonists. Some were in their second generation, and the population was growing. The early Industrial Revolution was bringing new labor saving technologies with gravity powered machines like grist mills, which primarily would have served the local populations. Trade was still restricted by the impracticality of moving large quantities of heavy goods on land routes. And the Musconetcon was not a navigable river. It was too fast, too shallow, and too rocky to use boats. Nor did it make any sense to cart materials down through that narrow Musconetcon gorge. So south of the gorge, trade was possible because the Delaware River was navigable. Timber would go downriver, and the imported goods would go upriver. The village of Regalsville followed these trends, transitioning from a cove to anchor river uh, timber rafts to a sawmill and eventually to paper mills. But north of the gorge, things progressed differently. While there was migration, moving goods across muddy roads wasn't practical. People could walk themselves or ride a horse. And for most people, it was a one-way trip to be settled down. Goods, on the other hand, they didn't walk themselves. Trade was a back and forth enterprise and trips needed to be repeated again and again and again and the roads just didn't support that. And as a result, north of that gorge, the local industries that developed sought to supply the local growing populations with perhaps occasional extra goods traded via turnpikes to New York, New Brunswick and Easton. While before the mid 1700s, that geography was a main factor driving where and how humans lived, this later half of the century, transportation industrialization drove the change. These trends are complex and affected places differently. So we're gonna focus on one site now rather than a whole region, the village of Asbury, and principally its mills to illustrate how transportation and industry affected the landscape. So not much later after the French and Indian War, the American Revolution took hold. To the east of the Musconetcom Mountains, much of the New Jersey was a battleground. The mountains offered some distance from the front, and Adam Hall took an interest in land along the Musconetcom River to develop a mill in the area you see circled here. This is around 1781, maybe 1783. The original mill, Hall's Mill, was likely constructed to mill wheat and rye. We know this because by 1787, Hall advertised the mill for lease, including its adjacent commodious house. It was the house, still there. In 1792, the mill and Miller's house were purchased by a retired Revolutionary War Colonel, William McCullough. McCullough was a prominent landowner and he was becoming a rather successful miller. He also came to adopt the Methodist faith after 
Bishop John Asbury of England began to expand the religion's presence in North America. And it was in honor of Bishop Asbury that the village gains its name in Asbury. And one thing I think that's very interesting about uh, Bishop Asbury is he sought to bring people to the faith who were probably the most prominent people in villages where he went to go visit. And I think that's a good example of uh, how his strategy was for spreading the faith by uh, converting someone like uh, McCullough to Methodism. In addition to that first mill, Hall's Mill, McCullough purchased two mills on the Hunterdon County side of the river, Asbury's and Warren County. And there were a total of mil three mill seats. And by seat, it's meant the location of the mill race where the water wheels located. However, in a mill building, there could be multiple milling processes happening. By 1831, a total of three mills were in operation Asbury, but there were six milling processes at work. McCullough had developed a second grist mill, a plaster mill, a linseed oil mill, and a clover mill. One of the mills he purchased, he sold, and a woolen mill was uh, built. And the first grist mill remained processing grain. McCullough also went on to become a, a county freeholder, a commissioner in modern parlance, a legislator in state assembly and a judge for Sussex County. So a rather notable person in his day. Asbury had been growing into a prosperous milling center. By 1810, it boasted a number of large homes and it had a school, a minister, two taverns, a store, a post office, two doctors, a hatter, a tailor, and a cabinet maker. So it wasn't any little frontier village. This is a prosperous place attracting artisans, and professionals of their day. You can see here some of the buildings that survive from these different eras. This is one of the uh, older buildings in town. Uh, this is a uh, inn, uh, American house, and this is the general store. Uh, all were built in this uh, time period. However, Asbury wound up being bypassed when the region's most significant transportation improvement opened in 1831 with the Moores Canal's opening. This canal spanned 102 miles and travel between Jersey City and Phillipsburg took five days one way. Each canal boat hauled up to 70 tons of product, everything from coal to iron ore to grain and apple. And this really opened up markets. No longer were you relying on those muddy roads and horses. Here you could really move some volume. And the canal was pretty ingenuitive. You had to get over those mountains to go east. And to solve that problem, they had to build gravity powered pumps to move water up and down and to even power uh, getting these uh, basically like rail cars to get the canal boats up and over the mountains. It was a 914 foot mountain that they had to climb, uh, 1,674 feet of elevation change. And they used the Lake of Pacon as a source water which was around 900 feet or so. And that would then flood the canal down gradient. And there were 23 locks to lift and lower the boats. That canal trade was responsible for the growth of towns like Hackettstown and Washington Borough, and also for the development of industry along its route. But Asbury wasn't located on the major turnpikes and it wasn't located on this canal. It still continued to grow and it was anchored by its mills. By the middle 1800s, around the 1850s, it had added two more merchants, several blacksmiths, a butcher, a silversmith and a jeweler. And during that whole time, it maintained the two doctors and it uh, would have one or two lawyers or clergymen at any time. In the 1830s and 40s, several large houses of various revival styles were built including this house with the Italianate facade for the village's wealthiest resident. Uh, this building obviously still stands and there's several other column buildings in the village from this time period. Now when we get into the 1850s, the middle 1850s and later, we're talking about the railroad era. And like before when the surveyors were coming out in uh, you know, like 1715 with John Redding and then the turnpikes and then the canal, the routes that were used first were the natural gaps of the mountains. So here you can see the Central Railroad of New Jersey using the gap 
going through Glen Gardner. That's this railroad here. Here's the gap going through the Musconetcon Mountain. There's Schoolies Mountain up there. And it turns and follows the Musconetcon and then crosses and heads out to Phillipsburg and west into Pennsylvania and the coal fields out there. As the railroad surveyors identified these routes, there was a race to acquire and develop parcels. It was just like the land races you might have seen in a Western movie, but it was happening in New Jersey in the 1850s, not out in the plains in the 1870s. So that these trends of westward expansion that we would see later on in later historical periods were all happening here first. And by 1855, Asbury had a railroad station on the central New Jersey line, and that connected between Hoboken, Allentown, and those coal producing regions. Just like the Morse Canal, those early railroads applied new technologies across the mountains, long trestles like this in Highbridge, and record setting tunnels. Uh, I like this picture too of a rail trestle. This is in Changewater, and it just gives you a sense of. Uh, the railroads is crossing over the river here. Uh, there's a mill along the river in this area. It's not in the picture, but it just gives you a sense of what the landscape looked like at that time. Now, the Lehigh Valley Railroad came through a little bit later. It opened uh, in around 1873, and they used different technology to get over the mountains. They bored through the Musconetcon Mountain. This is right around where Interstate 78 goes up and over the Musconetcon Mountain. And at the time, it was the longest tunnel in the Eastern United States. It was three quarters of a mile long and one of the longest in the world at the time. I think it was in the top 10. And modern American blasting techniques were first developed and deployed in the boring of this tunnel and they were later used elsewhere. And a small village grew up just east of Asbury by about two miles and took on the name West Portal following its opening. And one of the things I like about this picture and many of these other pictures we saw with the canal and the railroad bridges is you always see the mountains in the background. You can see just what these folks were trying to get through with the technology available in their day. And it seems in the early years of the railroad, Asbury benefited. Uh, on the side of Hall's Mill, a new mill was built, uh, the one that stands there today around 1865. Now, uh, we think construction began around 1863, and its capstone is dated 1867, as you can see here. And we think it's likely that the Civil War, while a good time for selling flour, was a bad time to find labor to complete the mill. And it looks like in some of the masonry, we can see places where they stopped and started. By the early 1870s, the mill, called Hoffman's Mill now, had well surpassed its predecessor in sales. They added uh, four grinding stones total. Uh, I think before it had fewer than that. And Hoffman did quite well uh, with the mills. Also a wealthy newspaper man by the name of Thomas McElrath, then publisher of the nationally significant New York Tribune made his summer residence in Asbury between 1868 and 1882. I mentioned this because it shows that east-west connection to New York City and also that this was a prosperous, attractive village for uh, somebody who's you know, more the elite in New York City to make this their summer home. And this mill used a design called the Oliver Evans Automatic Mill. It was from the 1780s, it was improved a bit. But the idea here was that the milling process was one continuous process instead of several separate processes. The entire mill needed maybe one or two people to operate it because everything was powered by gravity of the falling water on the water wheel. Grain would come in from the ground floor, it'd go up to bins at the top, it'd go down and it'd get processed and ground and then would go back up to where it get bagged and then it would come back out with a gravity elevator outside the mill building and loaded into a wagon. It's pretty neat uh, considering it was all powered by water and just gravity. But by the 1800s, Asbury's economic fate started to change. A shoe factory had opened in 1860 and it was closed by 1874. After a fire in 1881, the woolen mill that was there was destroyed. It was operating since the 1830s, but it wasn't rebuilt. It seems that the early access to the market offered by the railroad soon was a whizzing train bypassing Asbury. And that Asbury was just one small village on a vast interconnected network of thousands of such villages. 
and it's just the rail network from New Jersey, the rail network was quite dense throughout the rest of the country, especially in the Midwest and East. It was from 1876. And this is what Asbury was competing with. Asbury had mostly grown during the early Industrial Revolution, where its products primarily served the growing local population with just some trade. The advances of the later or second Industrial Revolution displaced small agrarian milling villages like Asbury. So with the railroads, the West had really opened up. There was more farmland. Goods could flow in from the cities, from lands in the Midwest. Large rivers with even more power were dammed to serve la even larger mills, like this Washburn Mill in Minnesota on the Mississippi River. New processes and milling technology were widely adopted from innovations in Minnesota. And uh, in the 1870s and 1880s, uh, those innovations went all across the country. And this made the Oliver Evans automatic mill used in the Asbury mill virtually obsolete. On a small river like the Musconetcon, where the water power would vary with the seasons based upon how much flow there was, less in the summer, more in the spring, and the land was steep and it wasn't easy to expand, a four grinding stone mill couldn't compete in a national commodity market. And Hoffman's grist mill stood idle by the mid 1890s. So a person named Henry Riddle acquired the Asbury mill originally by lease and later wound up purchasing the mill. And why might you think you would do that? Well, turns out Henry turned, it was this young enterprising guy and he wound up picking up a shipment of graphite in the port of Newark that the usual miller wouldn't process. He thought it wasn't good enough quality, but Henry thought he could do it. It was loaded up by train and it was brought down from the Asbury rail station by horse-drawn wagons and barrels. It was milled and then refined in mineral parlance, that is, and sold to the vendor that had originally rejected. More orders wound up coming in for Henry to process more graphite. And he sought out mines to buy from directly. This meant he traveled by steamship to Sri Lanka. He established relationships with the mines and thus began a burgeoning graphite milling business that soon included the mill across the Musconetcon River that you can see in the photo here and several other mills along the Musconetcon and other nearby rivers to refine graphite. The business eventually grew into a four generation family business as, and today it's called Asbury Carbons still headquartered in Asbury. Uh, the mill across the river still processes graphite, and it's about one-fourth of the graphite demand for uh, materials. So think like carbon fiber or like lubricants, like you might put graphite into a sticky lock. No pencil lead though. With Henry Riddle's success, the graphite mill expanded, and it added new side structures shown in this 1909 map. And you can see in the detail on the map that the graphite mill operated day and night. And with Henry's success and the mill's success, Asbury started to grow again. And this growth is seen in the institutional buildings that were built. Both the church and the school were replaced in 1914 and 1919 from timber frame buildings to masonry structures. While there were no more grand homes added to Asbury in this time, the housing stock had a modest growth up until about the mid 20s. And the last style of homes you really see in Asbury or Craftsman era. So right around um, 1930 or so. And when the automobile era began, new roads were built. And again, the gap through Glen Gardner, which is right about here, was the preferred route across the Musconetcom Mountains, passing north and crossing the Musconetcom River, which is this dark curvy line here. So as you can see in this aerial photo from the 1930s, the old roads were being replaced with the new state highway. This is 31. And this is completed, I think it was 1928. That's the white line here with the rough edges. And again, Asbury was bypassed. And as a result of being bypassed with these transportation innovations from these different eras, Asbury still retains most of its historic buildings. It still has its original street layout. It still has distinct boundaries from nearby towns because it remains surrounded by rolling countryside. So if we wanna sum up this time period where we have a lot of innovation and technology change, we can see that the mountains were overcome 
by new transportation technology. And this changed the settlement patterns of this area. This was the canals, the railroads, and then the highways. The new production technologies allowed mass production, and that changed the centers of production across the country. New power sources diminished the reliance on water power. So the steam engine came in this time. So even though some of those large mills might have some water power, they might also be using steam power too. And eventually that's what a lot of industrial processes converted into. But somebody like Henry Riddle could use a niche marketing strategy to have a competitive advantage and be profitable in a small volume market, not in a big commodity market. And that's what allowed Asbury to continue and allows industry to continue today. So if we come back to these questions, um, you can see that I really like maps and photographs and I hope you like them too. So um, what I'd like to do, I, we're not quite done yet, but I wanna do a quick pop quiz and see if uh, folks wanted to uh, try and see if they can answer any of these questions that we set out for at the beginning. So for the uh, moderator, if you want to allow folks to chat or um, pop off mute for a little bit, uh, that's okay with me because I'm really curious what folks took away from this about why the landscape looks the way that it does. Oh no, no one wants to chime in. All right. Well, hopefully we've been able to answer these questions uh, for you. And what I wanna do is talk about what's the future behind these mountains? And one of the things that uh, is common to anyone who studies rural areas or geography is that they often have the most abundant natural resources. But oftentimes, this isn't necessarily the choice of the folks in that community. Now, you can also see that a few million years of ice ages and erosion made some places more accessible and more inaccessible for people too. And geography itself is a limiting factor to how the area developed and why there's so much left of natural resources. And you can also see how these economic patterns and changes in technology have a lot to do with the resources being left too, because the area was bypassed by a lot of transportation technologies. And we're quite lucky for that. And uh, a lot of the natural resources and cultural resources are just uh, absolutely abundant. Um, you know, here you can see the agricultural lands, uh, the Musconecons running through here. This is actually the old Central New Jersey Railroad going through here. And obviously the wide mountain valleys um, as well. And you know, we don't have that heavy industry because it was this area is bypassed from that era, that era of development. And we don't have the polluted land and water, but what we do have is historic districts in the 18th and 19th centuries. We do have farm stands and we have wild brook trout. And we have pretty good water quality. And that's the resources we have to work with today. With the abandonment of most all mills along the river, now, the Musconecon Watershed Association saw an opportunity to restore water quality by removing them. So far, we've removed five dams. Three of them were the former dams to support the paper industry in the lower Musconecon. When those dams were removed, including the 2016 removal of the Hughesville Mill Dam, shown here, migratory American shad returned to the river to spawn the next year. Through these dam removals, we've restored about one mile of river to be free flowing. And these are places where people now fish and kayak. We also received a donation of land from Asbury Carbons of three old mill buildings. So you can see here the circa 1865 Hoffman Grist Mill. You can also see Colonel McCullough's house and uh, the clear relationship to the river here and the current operating graphite mills over here. This building is where our headquarters is. So what we've done is we've adaptively reused one of these mill buildings. This was a commercial bakery and there's still a bakery oven in the basement. Uh, and it's a storehouse for the graphite mill. We've converted that into our office space. We've also done native planting along the riverbank and we have a demonstration garden with native plants in it. 
a laboratory building, which is stranded on an island in the river, and this is where the woolen mill was below beneath this building, we're in the process of securing approvals to demolish, which has taken quite a while. We're hoping to turn it into Musconecon Island Park, as you can show, see here, we'll improve the stairway getting down and take the building out. And then another building, the mill, we've been restoring gradually since 1994. And what we want to do here is house an expanded office space, meeting and classroom and exhibit area. And we call that an interpretive center. We want to showcase the watershed's resources, people's changing use of the land, and our role in restoring water quality and establishing new productive uses like recreation and tourism. Our new strategic plan will be focusing more on engagement and utilizing science to inform water quality improvements in the face of climate change. And those are themes that we want the mill to be educating folks about. So this year, we've got several projects going on. Cindy mentioned these at the beginning uh, in my introduction. Uh, this is a little bit more about them and we're working on several projects towards this goal to broaden awareness and action in the Musconecon watershed. So we're in the planning phase right now for the adaptive reuse of the mill including the interpretive center. We're also developing an interpretive plan and exhibit designs. And much of that is informed by the themes that we explored in this evening's talk. We're also working with the National Park Service to develop our first Wild Scenic River brochure so that people can connect with and know where to see and where to experience the Musconecon River. We're developing an interactive map of the watershed's recreational and historic sites and we're linking that online map to physical signs on the Musconecon Watershed National Water Trail, which was designated in 2020. And we have support from the New Jersey Historic Trust Heritage Tourism Grant Program to do that. We're also working with the Ramapo Lenape Culture and Land Foundation on our educational trail to include Lenape language on our interpretive and wayfinding signs. They make the existing trail into a full 3.8 mile loop trail system. The goal of all this work is to build awareness that the river is a valuable resource, that there are opportunities for economic growth in a post-industrial future that respects the river and its habitats, and that everyone can help in the river's stewardship. Preserving what we have has come through the careful work of private landowners, local governments, and a partnership with the National Park Service. More still needs to be done. There are more dams to remove, more land to preserve, water quality that needs to be improved and restored, and always there's new generations to educate about how to care for these fragile resources. It takes a whole community working together to keep a landscape intact and a river clean. We hope that this story of our watershed, of its changes and its changing people and uses inspires you. People have lived here for over 13,000 years and will only continue to be able to live here through stewarding its water and natural resources. What can you do to help? Well, here's some ideas for what you can do. Uh, we have some upcoming events like becoming a river watcher, uh, participating in the river cleanup. There's a petition that can be signed. We also have some great films that we developed last year that you could share via YouTube. Well, I appreciate the invitation to speak tonight, your kind attention, and I hope that we'll see you again at one of these upcoming events. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Hunt. We do have a question if we have a minute or two. I've got time for questions, no problem. All right, let me, uh, let me scroll to it. You discussed the displacement of the Lene, Lenape, and the diseases they face from European settlers. Do you know if there were any four small displacements where they were pushed out of the region after? Oh, sorry, I'm trying to scroll through this thing and it's kind of too small. Ah, okay, I see that. Um, oh, you see, you see the question. Um, so yeah, it talks about the European settlers, kind of like what we see in the Wild West movies. Yeah, I the records aren't so great, and you know one of the things that's difficult is that the written historical records were generally written by Europeans who were writing stuff down, so it doesn't 
usually have the Lenape perspective in it. So what I tried to share tonight were things that were pretty well recorded. You could consider them facts. There was this overlapping time period of European and Native American um, coexistence in the Musconecon Valley, that there was this Treaty of Easton that was signed and that officially um, ceded their land rights in New Jersey. Um, the, the conditions under which that treaty was signed, I think is like many other treaties that were signed, um, but uh, it, is, it is a document. Um, and, you know, Lenape still do live here and, you know, have, have kind of had to hide out and uh, be careful sometimes about uh, revealing themselves because not everyone's been kind to the presence still. And, you know, that, that's changed. Um, but, you know, some of the details about whether it's like the Wild West or whether there was um, um, some of the intentional spreading of disease, like there was uh, later on, it, it's, uh, it's not something that I've seen that's well documented. I'm not saying it didn't happen uh, or did happen, but uh, for this presentation, just tried to stay for what was well documented. Uh, can you discuss the current state of what mills still exist in the Muskinacong River Valley and what's being done to restore or repurpose any of them? Sure, there are a number of mills left and our interactive map, once we develop it, will indicate uh, the mills that remain and uh, you know what could be seen of them. So in terms of operating mills, uh, the graphite mill that I mentioned in Asbury is in the old mill building, but it no longer uses water power. It's actually still, but the equipment on the upper stories is still in the footprint of the old mill. The mill in Penwell uses its old milling equipment, but it no longer uses its water power. And it's a grain store. You can go and buy your chicken feed there or your pet food, um, you know, and farmers still use it for processing grain. Uh, there's other mills that have been converted to residences, like in Finesville or Beattystown. And there's a number of mills that are in ruins, uh, like the plaster mill in Stanhope near Netcon, and, and other mills that are barely a uh, pile of rocks, like the Squires Forge Mill uh, in the uh, Point Mountain Park area. Uh, the, the old paper mill that is at Warren Glen uh, is abandoned, and it can't come back to life. Uh, it, its water system uh, is, is no longer compliant with the Clean Water Act. Um, so we don't have any mills using mill water. And the only mill that would be open to the public would be the Asbury Mill in the watershed. Okay, do you know if there's anything particular about taxes zoning of Warren County and this region, Asbury in particular, that keeps it rural in nature? Well, one of the things that New Jersey has done pretty aggressively and is usually considered a model is around farmland preservation. So there is a property tax abatement for farmland owners. Uh, when I looked at my farmland and our house value, I'd say it's probably like a 99.5% reduction in uh, property tax compared to a residential use to an agricultural use. So that's a huge subsidy for keeping land in agriculture, just by reducing the taxes. New Jersey also has a dedicated funding through the corporate business tax and prior bond fundings for the open space program called Green Acres, and as well as the uh, agricultural preservation program through the State Agricultural Development Committee. Uh, and those are really what's put us at the forefront of land preservation. In the Musconecon Valley, around 40% of the land is uh, in some form of preservation, whether that's uh, public ownership or private easement. Um, so that, that's good. But one thing I'll point out is that there's still gaps. Uh, you could have uh, one parcel between two preserved farms uh, that, that could go to another non-agricultural use. And when you can't link up all those contiguous farm tracks, it makes it harder for somebody to you know, graze animals or, or farm productively. So I, I think that's one of the challenges we have today is trying to think about how we go that next mile and fill in the gaps for uh, land preservation. And where will you be able to access your brochure that's under development? Well, that brochure will be a print brochure. So you'll be able to get it from our office. And we're also gonna send it to our county communications and tourism departments. 
we'll also put a PDF copy on our website. Uh, and that's actually what uh, the Lower Musconnect on River Management Council has done is put a PDF copy on their website as well. And looks like one last one was asking about a list for native plants. So I put the link that goes back to your website that talks about native gardening. So uh, that's, uh, that's in comments for everybody. That is great. And uh, there's a lot of resources to learn about native plants. There's also the New Jersey Native Plant Society. They have a really great native plant list. And if you come to our plant sale, folks will try to match up your landscape with the plants that we have on uh, uh, available. Um, and yep, I'm sorry, I have one last one. Can one kayak on the Musconecton? Yes, you can kayak on the Musconecton. Um, we usually say to check the Bloomsbury gauge, so the US Geological Survey gauge, and if it's between two feet high and two and a half feet high, you'll have a pretty decent ride going down. And I will attest, I went down uh, last summer and it was at 1.58 feet. And it was some of the most challenging kayaking I'd ever done because of the amount of rocks in the complexity of navigating it. Uh, we do see some people go down after storms uh, when the water's all brown and uh, that can be enjoyable if you're experienced paddling in those conditions. And we just had one more come in. What became of the RR tunnel? The railroad tunnel, yes. So the first bore tunnel that went through uh, was actually, it's disused. And now there is a more modern tunnel that has uh, two tracks going through it, I think, or one track, but there's a more modern tunnel and they use that old tunnel as a bypass. Uh, and it's flooded a bit. They actually had a lot of trouble boring that hole because of the amount of groundwater in the mountain. Uh, and it's in use today by the Norfolk Southern Railway. Fantastic. So it looks like that is it for questions. Uh, I'd like to thank everyone who joined us and Dr. Hunt for presenting. Our next lecture will be given by Joan Donnelly, the Deputy Executive Director of the Delaware River Joint Toll Bridge Commission. He will talk about the bridges that cross the Delaware River with slides of historic photographs, news items, and documents. Well, thank you everyone. And uh, I'm sure we'll make this presentation available. And if folks are interested in reading more, I made sure to put links in here. So uh, all, everything here is hyperlinked. And uh, even on the last slide, there is a additional works consulted if you'd like to read more about the watershed. So I, I'd like to thank you all again for hosting us and spending your time learning about the Musk Connect Con. Well, thank you again. I found it very interesting. Have a good yeah. night, everybody. Have a good night.